welcome to the stage, Dr. Iji Alma Opara. No pressure. So boom, check it. It's five years ago. I'm sitting in my bedroom in the middle of the night. I'm sitting rocking my brand new baby, about two days old, baby Chimamanda. Chimamanda means my God never fails in my mother tongue, Igbo. And so she is nursing at my breast. I'm looking at her beautiful, fat, chocolate, mocha latte face. She's looking at me, wondering who this woman is, who she's listened to for about 10 months of her life inside of here. And I'm filled with all kinds of emotion. I feel joy and gratitude because I survived pregnancy. And that's something black women say in the United States. I survive pregnancy, right? I survived the delivery of this beautiful child. And we are rocking. I'm also feeling the emotion of pain. Because baby, after you've given, a ch given birth to an almost 10 pounder, <laughs> um, everything hurt. I'm hurting in the front, I'm hurting in the back, I'm hurting in the boobage, as she's tugging and pulling, you know how they do try to bite with their gum, trying to figure things out. It's a whole thing. I'm also feeling a bit of concern because I look down and, you know, have my little stool up for my nursing chair and my legs still look like tree trunks. They're quite swollen. And I'm like, ah. Okay, they should have gone down by now. But maybe, you know, it's, it's, it's been a couple of days. I got extra fluid in the hospital. I had a C-section. They put that stuff into you. Plus, I put an extra, you know, um, we call it in the business, adiposite over the course of my pregnancy. A little bit more poundage than I planned. So I say maybe it's all a mixture of fat and fluid. It'll be fine. But I know enough to worry. Because you see, your girl is a doctor. <laughs> so I figure I should maybe just check my blood pressure. So I do. It's in the 130s over 80s, you know, which is high for me. I'm usually serving 120 over 80, you know. It's usually giving 118 over 80, you know. So the 130s isn't really, as the kids say, giving. But um, I'm like, it's going to be okay. A little stress is going to be fine. Roll up into the next day. Swelling still the same, a little bit worse. I check my blood pressure again. It's giving 140s. I say, okay, um, maybe, you know, there's a reason why doctors don't, should not be their own patients. Let me call another real certified, board certified doctor, like the one that actually delivered my baby. So a fellow sister physician, and just let her know what's going on, just to be on the safe side, but I'm sure everything is fine. So I call her doctor, doctor, Patrice Harrow. Hey girl, what's up? Yeah, yeah, everything's still hurting. But um, the reason I'm calling you is your girl's legs, your girl's legs is still giving swollen. It's still a lot going on there, but it's just a little bit of fluid. I should probably just pee more, right? Like I'm okay, right? <laughs> she like, um, girl, if you don't take your happy question asking ass back to the hospital, <laughs> because you know what's up. You know what's up. And what she was talking about that was up and I should know and be concerned about is the condition known as preeclampsia. 
Now I'm feeling the spirit of preeclampsia, like a familiarity here. So I, I, I see my sisters and, and probably brothers and other siblings here who may be familiar, but just like my brother gave the dope decoding dictionary, maybe I should also break down the definition of that for those who may not know preeclampsia is a condition of high blood pressure in pregnant people, usually in the last part of pregnancy, and it also can happen postpartum after having the baby. And it's a high blood pressure condition that causes damage to organs like the kidneys, the liver, go to the heart, the brain, people get seizures, and people die. Matter of fact, my OB had just buried a patient who died in their sleep as a result of preeclampsia. This condition disproportionately affects black women. Okay, baby, you know this is true, and why? Because we disproportionately survive the chronic toxic stress, the multi-generational weathering of white supremacy, of anti-blackness, and of patriarchy and misogyny. Now we do it with grace and with style, but not without consequence. And the consequence is in our blood pressure, it's in our sugars, it's in our autoimmune systems, it's in our bones, joints, it's in all of this, the weathering. And so she said, um, girl, uh, get your ass to the hospital. So I hung up, I said, you didn't even pass your boards anyway, click, um, mama. <laughs> she did, she did. Um, she's brilliant. I, I looked at my mother and, who's here in the audience and I said, mama, um, uh, I, it, I'll be fine, right? Like, I mean, this is my mama, right? She's always, it's called me fine, baby. So I was waiting for her to say the same. I just need to just w chill. Maybe I'm stressing. I shouldn't really stress. Girl, my mama was already packing my bags and getting all my stuff together. She wasn't even entertaining the conversation. She was gonna make sure she escorted her baby to the hospital um, and wasn't even entertaining the nonsense. So I said, anyway, whatever, husband. Now, you're my husband. So you're gonna support your girl, your, your queen, when she wants to kind of stay a little bit because she don't wanna go to the hospital. I just got here, I just left there. I don't wanna go back there and pack up this baby with this goddamn car seat and this bloody diaper. It's a lot. My husband was already in the car with the engine going, all right, hey baby, he's watching on uh, streaming along with all the others and um, they were ready, so I had no choice but to pack up the baby and the goddamn car seat. Thank you, God, for the deliverance from this bloody car seat and diaper bags and just, you know, I hope I took my wallet. Got into the car, and we were down I-94, 30 minutes in the ER, and by then, what you think that blood pressure was? Sky high, what? Who was there? Somebody was in the ER with me. It was 170. It was 170 over goddamn 90 something. And oh, and God bless them folks. I said, you all definitely did well in school because the speed at which they got my butt to the back of that ER and got me hooked up to that IV magnesium and got me started, you st stripped and on a cobweb of a, a gown. I have so much empathy for patients in those gowns, but you know, I was practically, I mean, I mean, they should have just let me be naked, but I was in that gurney and getting that medicine and I was just in a state of just gratitude. If I had stayed one more hour, couple of hours, or that night, trying to be stubborn, trying to be hard headed, trying to be super strong, black woman, whatever, right? I wouldn't even be there for the people I think I'm trying to hang on for. Make no damn sense. And so I sat in that gurney, practically naked. Baby Chimamanda still nursing away with no clue what was going around. That she almost lost her mama that she just met. Surrounded by my loved ones, my mama, daddy, 
my husband. And just when I was embracing that moment of peace, A woman walks her happy ass into my room and goes, all right, so we're ready for you upstairs now. And um, the only thing <laughs> I'm just going to say is that um, you cannot bring your baby because, you know, we, we can't, you cannot bring your baby. I said, oh, I appreciate how clearly happy you are at mm, 8 p.m. in the middle of practically night to deliver this news, I would also like to add that um, I cannot be separated from my baby. This is an exclusively breastfed baby. This also means I am her food. If we are separated, she you know, won't eat and there will be consequences like badness. Also, this whole thing about bonding that is critical in these first few days. So thank you, great news, will need to be amended. I cannot be separated from my child. With my from my child, thank you. And she goes, because you know you got to talk like them sometimes. So, um, so, so she goes. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. I don't think you understand. Um, we we cannot accept the baby. You, it's only for you. So what will I do with this child, ma'am? I mean, you're talking about this baby, literally stapled to my chest, <laughs> literally. All right. Even Chimamanda was giving her the side eye. Like I know this. So, um, and so um, she's noticing uh, <laughs> that, you know, the air has shifted in the room because I was getting a little bit worked up. <laughs> I just gave birth. I haven't slept ever. And you're telling me I'm literally fighting for my life and now you're telling me I can't see this is why I didn't want to come to the goddamn hospital and y'all made me come to the hospital and yes you saved my life but what is this and why why can't I bring my baby with me and then she utters these three words I'm sure we all have heard at some point in time in our lives these words that are designed to remind us of the fact that we are excluded from spaces that make decisions that impact our lives by people that don't look like us, but is a way to shut us down and remind us that Haha, your voice doesn't matter. Matter of fact, you are voiceless. And those words are, ma'am, it's our policy. Policy, where, what? It's really funny how policy never shows up. It's just said with the hopes that by uttering this word, this heavy weight of policy, it will shut you down. And you don't have to fight or insist because then you become belligerent. You become uh, 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 the, the problem in the moment. You become non-compliant. So that can go in the chart, and that can get reported, and it's a thing. Now, let's keep in mind I'm holding space in the hospital where I work mm, as a physician, nonetheless. A hospital that labels itself as a baby-friendly hospital. Whose baby? Because this baby is not feeling no friends. And so I put my head down as my heart begins to beat faster in my chest, faster, thicker, harder. I'm hearing it in my ears. My body is shaking. My, my, my body is feeling hot and then cold and hot and then cold because I know I'm going to have to... That part. <laughs> that part. That part. That I'm going to have to fight and I don't want to fight because I don't know how it's going to look and I don't also want to be arrested while nursing a child and getting IV treatment for goddamn preeclampsia in my own hospital. And so I do the thing that I do when I'm not sure what to do and that is I look up, I look behind, and I look within. I look up to a divine creator who created me wonderfully, fearfully, beautifully, and perfectly. I look up to a divine creator that gave me a voice, 
gave me a spirit, gave me a soul, gave me a body, and said, I matter, I am valued, I'm loved, I'm lovable, I am worthy of speaking and speaking up. I look behind to a long train, long line of ancestry, of people who have stood up and stood out and spoken up and spoken out against all forms of unjust policies and laws and rules and regulations spoken on, spoken, written on, written. You know, our Malcolm X's and our Martin Luther King's, our Fannie Lou Hamer's, our Malcolm, our Malcolm X's, our, our Rosa Parks, our Harriet Tubman's, our Queen Queen Kandakis, our Queen Aminas, okay, my grandmother, my mother, all right, the Aba women of Igbo and Imo region in Nigeria, the, all the people that have stood up and continue to stand up and say, oh no, we are not beholden to your unjust policy. That is not the policy that we respect, respect or recognize. We stand on a policy of love and of justice, a policy of blackness and black family bonding that is held sacred and sacrosanct, where we don't separate from each other, but we build and we keep together because that is our power. That's the line that I come from. And so therefore I look within and I remind myself my DNA. I come from this long line of people. They spoke, I shall speak. I shall speak because of this baby at my breast. I shall speak because of her older sisters at home. I shall speak because of all the women that come into this space and are told, it's our policy, this giant colossal beast of exclusion and dehumanization. And they don't have the words or the resources or the internal fortitude or the ability or the recognition because someone didn't tell them who they were, so they acquiesce. And they say, sure, separate me. And then those data get read as disparities. Black women don't breastfeed. Black women don't breastfeed. You prevent black women from breastfeeding. Black women don't bond with their babies. You prevent them from bonding with their babies. We got to talk about how the structural pieces are put in place that prevent us from being all that we can be, all that we want to be. And someone has to put words to this. And in this moment, that person is me. And was I afraid? Yes. Because even though I serve fire, I hate conflict. I really do. I hate fighting. I hate, I, I want to dance and sing and love all day. And this is all I want to do all day. I hate cussing people out. I don't know a lot of cuss words. I don't, you know. Ijama fight. Is it like this? I don't know even the poses. So I was scared. But what kind of mother will I be? How can I not protect and defend this baby when she just got here if I don't do it now? When will I? Is it when she's in the school system? Is it when she's in the streets, in the grocery store, library, all the places that are the places? And so I lifted up my head, took a deep breath. And I uttered the six words of empowerment that I know and I've learned from the long line of Karens. <laughs> Ma'am, I need to see your... <laughs> and that started a whole night of seeing many managers. All night, I saw them all. I didn't even know these managers had managers who had more managers. And then there was a supervisor who had the manager, who had a director, and then a vice president who had a manager. And this continued all night. I had no sleep. I had no nothing. Baby still to my breast. One and then the other, she likes the left. And it is just ongoing. I am battling, I am tied up to the magnesium. My blood pressure is still sky high. By the way, I came in for high blood pressure. So what do you think my pressure was doing this whole time? Staying high. And, um, and, and this was the battle all night to the morning when eventually, yes, I was admitted with the baby with the baby, with the baby. And by morning, 
when hopefully enough people were as sleepless as I was, they started trooping into my room to apologize and explain. Well, you see, the palaché and then the palaché. And so the question was, well, who is at the table making this palaché? Who is your palaché people? And um, can I join? Because clearly, we need more people around this palaché making table. And that's at that, then, and yes, they did accept me on the policy making committee. <laughs> now, as far as I know, the policy still stands, but I set a precedent, and precedent matters. Precedent matters. And I believe that that policy has been applied now with a little bit more context, less sort of one size fits all to accommodate the reality that you cannot be con conflicting in your statement around being a baby friendly hospital, but exclusively breastfed babies are not to be friends. And so, uh, and so that is an ongoing process. But one of the things that it did do was jumpstart my career as a not just a physician scientist, but a physician scientist activist. And my work in changing systems and structures over time, which came in very handy post George Floyd, May 25th, 2020, when the healthcare system along with America finally woke up and said, oh, so racism. And we had to then begin to vocalize to my own field that yes, racism, yes, white supremacy, yes, anti-blackness, and medicine, healthcare, not only are you part of the problem, you're part of the origin of the problem. And we have to start to look within ourselves for the ways that we create and perpetuate the problem. We have to look within ourselves for the ways that we value the voices, lived experiences, bodies, and brilliance of black peoples, especially black women. And so I train my trainees, my medical uh, uh, trainees and mentees, I have many all over the country of tr who have trained and created programs of training to teach healthcare professionals what cultural humility and what it means to be anti-racist and anti-oppressive, what it means to value and see black people, especially black women, as human and worthy of love unconditionally, to create policies of love, policies of justice, policies of true, complete, holistic healing, not just physically, but spiritually, mentally, emotionally, and communally, because we don't do this work alone, we do it together. We don't get freedom alone, we get it together. And more importantly, Chimamanda is five years old. Yeah. She still tries to breastfeed, but I say, girl, you, if you don't sit, you're happy. <laughs> She's in kindergarten, and yesterday I went to, two days ago, I went to go see her, her teacher, and the teacher said, Mama, I don't know what you're doing, but keep doing it. This child is one of the most confident, outspoken, firm <laughs> girls who knows what she wants and will ask for a manager in a hot second. No. She don't ask for a manager yet, that'll be second grade. But, but she and her sisters Onre Bubechi and Ugo Chinyere, hey babies, they're watching on streaming, um, are my pride and joy. They are one of the reasons I use this voice and speak in any space at any time, even when I'm scared. I keep on reminding myself that courage is not the absence of fear. It's doing the right thing even when I'm afraid. And it's worth it because these children are my second chance. These children are my first, second, third, and ongoing chance to be better, to live a life of giving, so that they can be an example for others as well. I have three girls, three black girls, soon to be three black women. And these are girls that know who they are, why they are, where they come from. They're girls that when they, when they address the world, and anytime they're stuck, they know to do three things to look up, to look back, and look with them.
Dr. E.G. Alma Opara, the next Speaker of the House of Representatives.